It's really something when a kid who has a hard time becomes a kid who's having a good time. In no small part, thanks to you throwing that kid in the air again and again on a mile-long walk home from the Indian joint. As her mom looks sideways at you like, you don't need to keep doing this because you're pouring with sweat and breathing a little bit. Now you're getting a good workout, but because the kid laughs like a horse, up there laughs like a kangaroo, beating her wings against the light because she laughs like a happy little kid. And when coming down and grabbing your forearm to brace herself for the time when you will drop her, which you don't, and slides her hand into yours, and she says for, you know, the 14th time, the 15th time, inexhaustible, her delight again and again. Again and again, and you say, Give me till the redbud tree, or give me till the persimmon tree, because she knows the trees and so quiet you almost can't hear through her giggles. She says, Okay, till the next tree, when she explodes, howling, yanking your arm from the socket again and again, all the wolves and morning doves flying from her tiny throat. And you throw her so high, she lives up there in the tree for a minute. And she notices the ants organizing on the bark and the bumblebee caressing the little unripe persimmon in the beret. She laughs and laughs as she hovers up there like a bumblebee, like a hummingbird, up there giggling in the light, like a giddy little girl up there. The world knows how to love. This is the Mac Oligarchy Podcast, and I'm your host, Tim McClone. That was a poem called Throwing Children by Ross Gay. So, Tim, well, you know, what's up with the poems? You know, a long time ago, I started reading poems and memorizing a poem once a week for recall. And what I found was also in business, it was helpful. So I'd memorize a poem usually take me a week to 10 days. And what I found was you're exercising both your right, left brain, it's causing you to be very creative. But in business situations, in my humble opinion, when you're trying to provide solutions to problems on projects, I came in with another outlook, in my opinion. It gave me kind of an edge, a sizzle over the competition. And it allowed me to think creatively in a unique way and provide kind of a a sizzle to the solution that other competitors couldn't. And I found it very helpful for my recall and I found it very helpful in business for that reason. And I suggest, and I've always liked writing and I always like poems and it's just classical poems, whatever they might be contemporary. I recommend you mix it up and do things that you're passionate about in poems. And one big thing for me is family. A lot of my poems set around family and love and what have you. And I find when I do these types of poems, it really helps me in business situations to think a different way because you're leveraging both sides of your brains when you spend time memorizing, especially philosophical poems, business type stuff. And uh, it's come in handy. And uh, I recommend you do that. Absolutely 100%. So, you know, we're doing some audio podcasts. I have some interviews. But like I said, I have four or five verticals going right now, and I'm working all the time, traveling. So we will be doing that, some interviews down the road. Absolutely. Um, But, you know, I miss, back in the day, I used to listen to Nori, George Nori. I used to listen to Howard Stern, of course, and uh, when he was for The Working Man. And I remember Howard Stern, and when he signed his second contract, he uh, was brought into the office. I don't know if it was by Les Moonves one of the big wigs at the stations. And uh, the gentleman sat Howard Stern down. And this is when Howard Stern changed. And uh, he said, Howard, you see that painting behind me? That's $120 million, Picasso. He goes, you're the Picasso of terrestrial radio. You're the Picasso of radio. That was the downfall of Howard, because I think he believed it. He believed it. And he changed whatever happened to him, you know. He started hanging out with Paul McCartney and um, and whatever happened to him during the uh, last three years during the uh, infection, uh, you know, he's hiding out in his house for the last three years. So he went off his rocker. So my point is, 
Don't ever lose who you are. Don't lose your edge. Don't stop working no matter how much money you have because when you, when you stop, and we know a lot of people around me in my sphere and talking to people that when they retire and don't get up and have that vigor and drive in the morning, whatever it might be, you die and have a heart attack. You got to keep pushing. You got to keep creating. And that's something my father taught me, and he's still doing it to this day, working five days a week, killing it. He's a lawyer, stockbroker, accountant, and uh, most of all, a family man. And uh, you got to keep creating. And that's the philosophy that I, that he's instilled in me, and I recommend and I send it down your way, just as a thought. So remember what Pablo Picasso said. I like to live as a poor man with lots of money. And um, I want to discuss a couple topics in this video, and then we're going to touch on some quick health and fitness, of course. But uh, what's going on in Japan right now, ladies and gentlemen? And there are many in Japan, unlike the United States, Japan has unexpectedly slipped into a recession. You know, in the United States, we had two consecutive quarters of negative growth to GDP in early 23, but the Biden administration changed what a recession is in the metrics, which is false. We are in a recession right now, 100%. And that's uh, just very interesting. Japan is, I think, you know, you, you have to look at the global markets holistically because it affects everything. We got a lot of global disruption going on right now, and I think it's important to talk about. And number two, what's going on in France? I mean, we got to talk about Orwellian here. We'll just briefly touch on that. But it's a little crazy. And it's, we saw it over here, but this is a topic, number two, that I have to be very careful talking about. Uh, because. Uh, you don't want to get warnings. So, like I said, Japan unexpectedly slipped into a recession, and it's losing its title right now as the third biggest economy to Germany, and raising doubts about when the central bank would begin to exit its decade-long ultra-loose monetary policy. Let's just keep printing. You talk about problems over here. Let's keep those interest rates at zero. Unfortunately, you're probably never going to see 2% again. So some highlights, uh, what's going on over there. Uh, so the, you know, there's some supply constraints. Uh, they're delaying execution of their spending plans. And, you know, Japan's GDP shrunk for two quarters, just like the USA, by the way, again. So I just want to harp on that because, uh, you know, those are the facts. Uh, they've had negative growth over there as well. And they also have shaky capital spending and consumption. And some of the analysts are pushing back on uh, bets of an early exit to negative rates. So the analysts are warning of another contraction in the current quarter as weak demand in China's sluggish consumption and production halts at, uh, you know, a, a, a unit of Toyota Motor Corp all point to a challenging path to economic recovery. You think, you think. So I did some talks on Japan on the YouTube channel. And um, they're going through a tough time right now. And uh, we had to keep an eye on that because all the global markets are intertwined, as you folks know. So when you look at the data, it's clear that the key pillars of domestic demand is way down. They have no key drivers of economic growth right now. Japan's gross domestic product fell an annualized 0.04% in the October-December period after a 3.3% slump in the um, roughly the, you know, the previous quarter. And that's what the government data showed. So they're, you know, confronting a market forecast for a, a roughly about a 1.4% increase only. So two consecutive quarters of contraction, you know, this is important to say, are typically considered the definition of a technical recession. See how we say it? We call it not a recession. It's a technical recession. So we can slither out of, well, technically we're in a recession, but we changed the metrics, which have been the same metrics since World War II. So 10 plus times since World War II, the United States has had two consecutive quarters of negative growth to GDP, and it's always been a recession. But not this time in 2023. So uh, once again, the USA is in a recession. So check this out. So currently in Japan, they've had two consecutive declines in GDP and three consecutive declines in domestic demand. That's bad news. Even if, it, if, even if the revisions... And I was looking at reports, and they're talking, even if we revise it like the U.S. did, let's revise what a recession is, uh, may change the final numbers at the margin only. So see the word games they play 
let's revise those numbers so it doesn't show a recession. Just like uh, the current administration, no administration, Republican or Democrat, should be doing this. You shouldn't be changing what the, a recession is. It's embarrassing. And more economists should come out and speak against it. So I guess, I guess it's not two consecutive quarters of, of negative growth to GDP anymore. Uh, it's only been the metric for a recession since World War II, ladies and gentlemen. So it's just, it's a clown show out there. When I look at Congress and I see the sessions going, I mean, we just need to have clowns jumping in front of these people. It's unbelievable. So this, you know, it, it makes it harder for the central banks to justify rate hike, let alone a, a series of hikes. So the yen was steady after the data and last stood at roughly 150.22 per dollar, pinned near a three-month low hit earlier in the week. So yields on Japanese government bonds fell after the data as some traders pushed back bets on uh, early you know, Bank of Japan policy shift. So the benchmark 10-year yield slid four basis points to 0.715%. Weak domestic demand makes it hard for you know, the BOJ to pivot hit it towards monetary tightening. So Japan's normal GDP stood at 4.21 trillion in 2023, falling below 4.46 trillion for, for uh, you know, Germany to rank as the fourth largest economy the data showed. So when you look at consumption, capital expenditure, they shrank for three straight quarters. The B, you know, the the Bank of Japan has been laying the groundwork to end negative rates by April and overhaul other parts of its ultra-loose monetary framework, but it's likely to go slow on any subsequent policy tightening and then lingering risk, and they got a lot of risk. So an exit um, from accommodative policy would come at a time the U.S. Federal Reserve is pausing after aggressive interest rate hikes. Look what happened in the U.S. the last couple of days with interest rates. Like I said, early in the year, they said they were going to, you know, looking at four to six decreases. It doesn't look that way now. And I said, I said in one of my talks, don't hold your breath. And it seems to be the case right now. Um, you know, so I don't, you know, it, it's just such a volatile year. You can't really predict. And uh, it's wildly expected to, you know, reduce borrowing costs this year. Uh, the, the International Monetary Fund revised up. It's global growth forecast in January as the outlook for the United States and China brightened. But, you know, they warned of risks, including geopolitical tensions, what's going right now in the Middle East. It's been a disaster. And so there's a lot of global tension right now, moving parts. And uh, the bottom line is you have to keep an eye on it. It's just um, ever changing every day you get up. It's just uh, spinning your head around. So these global markets are interconnected. This is something I'm very close to. I get a lot of reports on this. I work with an investment bankers. It transitions into real estate. First and foremost, an investor. You're looking at markets globally uh, by country, uh, you know, USA by region and localities. And, uh, you know, I'm on conference calls globally. What's going on globally in markets? Regionally, I get reports from investment bankers. What's going on? And this stuff's important to understand holistically and then break it down locally for whatever markets you're looking to invest in. It's all intertwined. So I think it's important to touch on these countries. And it's interesting. I think the key takeaway is, you know, technically, we're in a recession in Japan. We're in a recession. And the United States is in a recession. I know it's a political year and we want to play word games. And uh, we're in a recession. Bottom line. So moving on to France, I have to be very careful with this. Uh, violators of a policy will face a 45,000 euro fine and three years imprisonment for questioning the science. The science. So I'm going to top line this. It's known as Article 4 in France. It's a highly illiberal law prohibits residents and citizens from saying anything bad about therapeutic treatments overall for anything. So you say something that the government likes that are mandated or mandatory or recommended by the French government, that's a $45,000 euro fine if you don't agree with it, and three years imprisonment. So uh, that's a little wild. They won't tolerate any criticism of therapeutic treatments, um, which is made by the oligarchy of the uh, state. Any person who dares to openly criticize these therapies will be liable to fines and imprisonment 
these people, folks, are sick. Uh, you know, renowned doctors are being targeted and, you know, silenced. Uh, you know, the bottom line is, as I talked about in my first podcast, it's going on globally, more so a little bit in other countries. It's a little more undercover in the United States. Uh, France is taking a totalitarian run. And Macron and his henchmen are followers of the WEF that I've talked about, the World Economic Forum and Globalist Policies. So, to end, put a bow on this, some accounts are saying that Article 4 was proposed but not actually passed. So it remains to be seen if any you know, enforcement comes about because of this alleged ruling. Even so, the fact that there are politicians out there who believe this type of fascism, I just think it's very concerning. Don't you think? I think it's really concerning. And you're seeing that type of fascism uh, in the United States. It's just uh, way out of control. It seems like the judicial system has been captured in the United States. And uh, I don't risk, you know, wish this type of totalitarianism on, uh, if you want to break it down politically, on libertarians, Democrats, Republicans. I'm middle of the road on a lot of policies, my friends. And, um, it's just a little crazy. And when we talk about investors in real estate, and someone spoke about this all over the news, it's going to pull a lot of investment, for example, out of New York. Some of these rulings that they're uh, going on. So when a bank says, hey, we're happy with, you know, Tim McClone, uh, he pays his loans on time. He, you know, he's, you know, he's paid back over a billion dollars of loans. We want to do business with Tim McClone again. By the way, Tim McClone's a whale. We love him. He's at the top of our list to do business. There's no crime. Uh, there's nothing going on. But hey, we don't like this guy. What do you think other investors are going to do? And when they say, hey, don't worry, we, we don't like this guy. But we won't come after you. Well, maybe you don't like my hair. Maybe you don't like the way I walk. Maybe you don't like the suit I'm wearing. Maybe I'm too clean. Maybe I'm too dirty. Who knows? And then you're going to come after me. New York just shot itself in the foot. And they lost, they're going to lose billions, trillions of money because investors are going to be scared to invest there. Uh, I don't wish this on uh, uh, Barack Obama, uh, Donald Trump, uh, Joe Biden, anyone. This is, it, you, you have to look at the big picture. This is, this is Venezuela. This is fascism. This is communism. And you, you, it's just totally illegal. There's no crime, nothing. The banks made money, the individual made money, who took the loan, they want to work with the individual again. It's all political, uh, but it's scary, and it shouldn't be happening in this country. Let the people decide who should be president of the United States, whether it's a Democrat or a Republican. We don't want to do that anymore. We want to become Venezuela. So you got to be careful where you do your investments right now. We don't have any investments in New York, and uh, I wouldn't buy there. Not at all. No way. So it's just getting out of hand. And, uh, you know, it's all over Twitter. There's a lot of people talking about it. And I think people should talk about it uh, because it's getting uh, quite insane out there right now and um, on all fronts. And uh, I think it's important to have this chatter and talk about what's going on out there. You know, because I'm not, I'm not a fan of both Democrats and Republicans. You know, 75% of House Democrats just right now, and I talked about this earlier, voted against deporting criminal migrants who commit social security fraud. That's right, ladies and gentlemen. I, I, I said they, 75% of House Democrats voted against deporting criminal migrants who commit social security fraud. They'd rather protect illegal aliens than our senior citizens. And that's from the House Judiciary Committee on Thursday, and it was posted on X. So Democrats talk a big game about, you know, Republican attacks on social security. But 75% of House Democrats just voted against deporting the illegal aliens who commit social security fraud. So Biden's Democratic Party, which used to be the party that I loved, used to be the party of the working man and, you know, Kennedy Democrats. I don't know what's happened to this party. And, and frankly, the Republican Party, too. Um, the Democratic Party is so ruthlessly and menacingly and in my opinion, staggeringly extreme on immigration, more than the Republicans, they are not even willing to remove law-breaking law -breaking criminals, aliens who steal identities and prey on seniors. It's astonishing. I don't, 
I don't know, ladies and gentlemen, call me old fashioned. I just think, shouldn't our seniors and veterans come first in this country? Our homeless? Oh, meanwhile, you know, also, just so you know, 150 uh, Democrats also voted against legislation that would quickly deport illegal aliens who drive drunk. You know, I, I'm a, you know, I'm appalled to see the majority of Democrats in the House of Representatives voting to prevent, prevent illegal aliens who endanger the lives of American citizens by drunk driving for being deported. So, you know, I, it took me over a year and a half to get citizenship in, in Mexico. And I've been working on citizenship in another country as well. And I'm on year three. And I'm going to tell you, if I went to Mexico and I said, listen, I'm going to have a baby and I want you to pay for it. And I want you to do this and this. They cut off my head and roll it down the street. Okay. I'm a, I'm a big believer in legal immigration, not illegal immigration. Everyone talks about the United States, the Statue of Liberty. We'll take your poor. We'll take your weak. But what people don't realize is back way in the day, when you would go to a farm, for example, and you'd say, sir, I'd like to work on your farm. I have no money. I have nothing, but I have some skills. That owner would say, please, will you come work on the farm, do some crops, do some chores, rest your head at night, get a nice bowl of soup, and you had to work for your pay. But what, and that's what our country was about back in the day, the Statue of Liberty. But what changed, ladies and gentlemen? The United States became a welfare state. We're a dumping ground. So everyone wants to come here and get the handouts. That's what's changed. So that doesn't apply anymore with the Statue of Liberty. We can't be the dumping ground for every country in Venezuela and all these countries are dumping their prisons and put them in our country. They will give you the worst of the worst. The stupid Americans will take them. And that's what's going on right now if you follow this internally. I've gone to the border. I have friends that are border agents. I know what's going on with the fentanyl and the human trafficking, and I find it appalling. It's dangerous for citizens in this country, in this country, and the, the cartels have moved way into the interior. They're not just in Texas, Arizona. They're up north. They're in the Midwest. And it's being allowed because, this is another discussion for another day, the drug business is a trillion-dollar-a-year business. It's big business, and not just for the cartels. It's a trillion-dollar-a-year business. We could shut the border down in one week. The United States' technology is 30 years ahead than you know. They're 30 years ahead. And a guy at the Pentagon told me this a long time ago. My friend's dad worked at the Pentagon. And uh, like, we're 30 years ahead. He goes, uh, every year we say we need defense money, even under the Trump organization. Oh, my God, the defense is depleted. We would never let our defense get below other countries. China's equipment, is a lot of it's outdated. It doesn't work. We are... When you talk about space, satellites, uh, the technology that we have, laser weapons, uh, weather weapons, all this stuff, it's true. And we're ahead. But we just do that. Dude. Let's get another $800 billion package because uh, we're you know all our stuff is falling apart. So there's some truth to that with our tanks and certain things from the research that I've done. But, you know, we're way ahead in, in uh, our technology. And, um, you know, don't believe that little story out there so you know it's just crazy with the immigration right now but we right now we have an anti-american wing of the democratic and republican parties both parties in congress and i've always said heaven has walls and hell has open borders and you're not a country and i understand the globalist agenda and what they want to do as far as having open borders and i get it and open trade and all these things but you know, when you have $35 trillion in debt, when you have 10 more million Americans in poverty due to COVID-19, and now the inflation is killing people, and I, I, you see more people are sleeping in their cars, more people are on the street, an astonishing amount of Americans, 30 plus percent, 30, 35 percent, you know, are homeless. It's just insane. And like I said, 60 percent of Americans only have $400 in your account, in their accounts. So if you work in Congress, you should be ashamed. And your constituents and what you're doing, I mean, 60% of Americans, it's insane. That's not a healthy country. That's not, a, a, that's not the economic engine of the world, the United States, when 60% of your people can barely feed themselves and have enough for an emergency if something happens. And that, that's, yes, it falls on the individual, but it also falls on the policies 
and what they're doing a lot of this stuff by design. It shouldn't be happening in the United States of America, ladies and gentlemen. It shouldn't be happening in this country. And it affects everything. I'm not just talking about the ultra poor. A lot, of, a lot of people that work on Wall Street, and you can say, don't feel sorry for them. I'm not talking about the billionaires. I'm talking about people that start little small businesses and you know make gross $10 million, $5 million for their business a year. These people are important. They're decimating them. They're getting decimated too. So it's just bad all around. All I'm saying is I believe in legal immigration. Maybe we just close our border for a while. And it's a privilege to come here, and we should take the best of the best. You have to assimilate to this country. People need to be interviewed, you know, and people shouldn't be able to come to this country illegally and bring their diseases and not be tested, but the American people are tested. And the list goes on and on and on. So I'm not going to get into that. So with that said, I want to end on a little health and fitness. And um, something I've seen a lot of, and i am always been cognizant since I was 23, living in Europe when I started the training. And I'm not just talking weights, a lot of martial arts boxing, what have you, but we'll focus on weight training right now. I see a lot of talks on this, but I was very early on, someone told me, Tim, you need to be careful that you don't get injured. And this is what you do to not get injured. And I followed the same protocol since I was 24. And I've never had a rotator cuff problem. I've never had a knee replacement, knee problem, a knee scope, hip replacement, hip scope, nothing, no back problems, ligament problems where I had to stretch and get orthotics. And all these things. So, I mean, I'm someone that every workout, no matter if it's an upper body or lower body, I do rotator cuff exercises to warm up my rotators, warm up my hips, and warm up my lower back. And when you get a little older, over 35, you want to warm up more before you get into your work sets. Standard stuff. So, I do think I know what I'm talking about. I've had a lot of interesting workout partners, and I got certified because I thought I was going to be in fitness my whole life for personal training and two different companies and did all that. And then fell out of it, but I still have a passion for it. But what I see a lot of is uh, people getting injured doing deadlifts and squats. And I think they're important movements, but I would challenge you, starting with deadlifts, if you're a bodybuilder and not a powerlifter competing in a competition, there's no need for them. I recommend doing rack lifts off the rack for your lower back. It's an awkward position where you start from on the floor and uh, you can get injured. I've worked out with so many partners that have had pinched nerves and what have you from deadlifting and they continue to deadlift. And some of these over 60%, 70%, their physiques don't change. And a lot of them were, they weren't, they said they're bodybuilders, but they did it for strength and they would try to put as much weight on, do one or two reps and they always got injured. The way I do deadlifts is I still do them. It never hits any one body part great. You say, oh, the lower back. Yes, it's a great exercise because it hits everything. Eh, it's not, it just doesn't hit everything great. Joe Rogan had a strongman on, top 10 strongman, and he said, took a lot of heat for it, if you're, if you're not competing in a competition, don't do deadlifts. If you're a bodybuilder, don't do it because it's, it's the, the risk to reward is too high for risk. And uh, I would agree with that. Also, I worked out with a top strongman in Europe told me the same thing. But what he did tell me is, he goes, Tim, when you do deadlifts, do them at the end of your back workout. So you're pre-exhausted. So after I do my whatever, four or five back exercises, I do deadlifts. And I only go 135 to 225. And I pause. And I do four second pauses down and four second pauses up. Try to do that when you bring the weight down really slow. You're not going to be able to do as much as you could, not even close. And you bring it down slow for a four count and up for a four count. It's really hard, but it keeps your technique tight and uh, you're pre-exhausted. You won't have to go as heavy and you'll get a, in a good workout. And I, I do tend, you, you don't want to do one, twos or threes or fours. I, you know, you want to do eight to, eight to eight to 15 reps. And, uh, it's just a risk to reward. And someone else told me a doctor when I called on orthopedist, I called on orthopedist for three years. And I said, what do you see a lot of? And I've said this before on talks on YouTube. Tim, I see a lot of uh, people with uh, hip knee problems who are runners. And I learned very early on not to be a runner. Marathon runners, people who run 10 to 15 miles a day, are getting hip replacements, knee replacements. And we see a lot of weightlifters with back problems, with knee problems. And this is from an orthopedist. He's like, Tim, if you 
want to be walking around at 67 years old, I would stay away from deadlifts and squats. Now, with that said, I have friends that are 60, 70 that do squat and deadlift. Okay? Um, but they did it right. They go 15 to 20 reps. And, they, and the same thing for squat. So moving on to squat, I pre-exhaust my legs. I do three exercises. And then I do the hack squat. Well, and famous bodybuilders have said that they don't squat and they did hack squats. Um, I like hack squats. I do. And uh, I do those at the end of my workout and not every workout instead of squatting. It's, it's, you're locked in. It can still be hard on your knees, but I pre-exhaust with, for example, leg extensions, uh, Bulgarian squats, which are great, by the way. I think they're even better than regular squats. You're just using your own body weight, maybe a light dumbbell, lunges, leg presses, and then I go to hack squat. I'm pre-exhausted and I do slow reps. I do five to 10 counts on the way down and I go slow up. It's extremely hard. It burns the hell out of your legs. It's better than seeing some guy put a lot of weight on a hack squat, wrap his knees up. I'm not a fan of wrapping your knees, wearing a belt. If you're doing, if you're doing, um, if you compete in a competition, yes, you're going to wear a belt. It gives you a little bounce at the bottom. But if you think a belt protects the delicateness of your spine, it doesn't. It doesn't. For onesies, twosies, whatever, uh, you get some, you get some bounce at the bottom and a little, little protection, but not much. And someone told me that a long time ago. And my knees are strong. I don't wear wraps because you know you wear wraps. You can do more weight. You get a bounce at the bottom. And, um, I don't do that. It's all about slow controlled movements, time under tension. Because you're not a power lifter, you're a bodybuilder. It's not the ego in the gym. And I've never been injured. And, you know, I've been up to 240 and ripped. So I think I know what I'm talking about a little bit. And um, I used to squat all the time. And I, I had a little few little minor problems. I could tell something was coming. And I stopped a long time ago. But my legs got bigger by um, doing other exercises besides squats and doing higher rep counts, but going hard to failure. Uh, squats is just a dangerous move in my opinion because some people have the hip flexors should you should your knees go over your your feet should they some say no some say yes i've seen all the talks on it but it is an awkward position too and a lot of people get injured doing squats and i'm not saying it's a bad movement but i think personally right now with the technology and machines and one-legged movements there's so many great exercises to do it i still hit it but i recommend if you want to do squats pre-exhaust your legs with three or four exercises and then you won't have to go heavy on squats. I know it's going to hurt your ego, but try putting 135 on or 180 or 225 and do sets of five where you, where you count down five and count down five up. You know how hard it is? Your legs are going to be burning and you want to be in this for the long game. I think the technology is there, not like the 70s or 80s or even 90s. The technology is there now where you can build a beautiful physique with machines going time under tension and slow controlled reps. You know, I've seen so many people tear their biceps, tear one by because they got the over under grip. I always go over on deadlifts on both hands. And, uh, you know, I, I go up to 315, sets of eight, light, uh, used to, and I just go 225 now on uh, deadlifts. There's a guy that I met a long time ago. You'll know who he is. I met him in Georgia, Ric Flair, the nature boy Ric Flair. And I asked him, because this is when I was neck deep in it, it was a long time ago. And I said, what do you, how do you work out? What do you do? Stay in shape. Because I knew back then, I said, what you guys do is very dangerous. I, I heard the stories back then, even that it was somewhat scripted, but it is a very dangerous sport. And you can get hurt. And these guys are, a lot of them are on pain pills, jumping from ropes. The things they do are very dangerous and they get injured. So it's not really fake. It might be scripted. But these guys are taking hits and taking beans. And I knew that when I had the conversation with him real quick, but everyone was kissing his ass and he was, you know, he was spending money at the bar. So I just wanted to take a different approach. And I said, Hey man, what, what do you, you know, you guys really take a beating out there. What do you do to work out? What's the, how do you stay in shape? What do you like to do? Do you work out every day? Whatever. And one thing he told me, he told me a few things, didn't talk to me that long. He said, Tim, I'm, I've never been injured. This is, kind of the middle stage of his career. And he goes, one thing that I do is I do 500 body weight squats every workout. I can't be sure if it was every workout, or every leg workout. 
I think what he meant was he does it, even if he does an upper body workout, he does the squats in between his exercises. And I said, really? He goes, that stops me, in my opinion, compared to my, my people in my sport, because a lot of them are injured and have problems. He goes, that's what's saving my knees and my back and my hips. Now, I did it. And what you do is you do five sets of 25 shoulder width, five sets of 25 wide stance, five sets of 25 close, five sets of 25 jumping squats, and then I threw in lunges, forward and back lunges. I'm going to tell you right now, I was sore for three days. And I still do it. Sometimes I forget it, but I at least do it every other day. I do, I'm, 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 I'm in, in the air transparency, I do about 350 to sometimes 500. You want to build your legs. That is, you, doing body weight workouts is a great way to build your body and endurance. And I think you should throw them in your workout. So for example, for two weeks, three days a week, I'll do a full body workout. There'll be, let's say, 15 machines. I'll do an upper body movement, a lower body movement. So you give the upper body a rest when you're doing it, and you go through 15 machines. That's one set. I do three sets. You're fried. It takes 20 to 30 minutes. But I always do the body weight squats, even though one set might be a squat movement, a leg movement, of course, and then I'll throw in you know, 25 squats, body weight. I am telling you, and then when I go back to conventional training, I go down, let's say for a back workout, I have more endurance, I'm stronger. So the key takeaway is throw in full body workouts to your workout. A lot of guys don't want to do that, but that will shock your body and build your body. But the, the body weight squats, my legs have come up because I'm doing that and I'm not risking as high injury. And you're going to think, wow, 500 reps, how's that going to, be? it will build muscle. And I hold them, I go time under tension. I pause and then go slow reps and I go fast reps one set, but try it. It's not from me. It's from the nature boy, Ric Flair. And he said it saved his joints and also built his legs a little bit. It's just something different to do um, because you want to be in this for the long game. And I have so many friends, uh, let's say from the nineties, they're either dead, they're burnt down on steroids. Uh, they got caught up in drugs and drinking, what have you. Uh, they're gone. Uh, or number four, they got injured. A lot of people get injured. I talk to people now in the gym, oh, I'm kind of working around an injury. I spend an ample amount of time warming up. I roll my body every day on a roller. I use rubber bands every day to stretch out my body in the morning before I go to the gym. And then when I go to the gym, I warm up again. It's so important. And then time under tension. Don't ego lift. Check the ego at the door. You're a bodybuilder, not a power lifter. Don't throw the weight around. Slow, controlled reps. I love to see, I see, you know, I see guys bounce around 225 on the incline. Try doing 185, doing five counts down, five counts up. You won't be able to do it, or it's going to be really hard. You're going to be able to do half the way you normally do, but you're going to, you're going to build your chest and you're going to build strength. So, to put a bow on it, be careful with deadlifts and be careful with squats. I'm not saying they're not valuable movements. I just think you have to be creative when you do them. When you do deadlifts, do them at the end of your workout. If you want to do squats and I can't convince you, then do them at the end of your workout and pre-exhaust your legs. I do think if you can't get it out of your head, and I'm so, I can't get it out of my head, so I do hack squats instead of doing squats. And I do them you know, once a week. Sometimes I take them out and then I do a full body workout. So I just want to touch on that, health and fitness at the end. Uh, I see a lot of injuries. I was just down there talking to a guy a couple days ago who got injured, and I don't like to see that. It just it takes a discipline not to get injured, and it takes discipline to throw your ego at the door because a lot of people want to do weight. But remember, you're a bodybuilder. You're creating a canvas. You're creating a piece of artwork. Someone told me that a long time ago. You're sculpting. You're not in it for ego. You're not a power lifter. And I, you're not there to listen to your music. You're not there to look at your phone. You're not there to walk around with your jug of water. I drink out of the fountain. I don't walk around with a jug of water. I don't copy people and walk around with my bag dragging on the floor. It's old school. Don't talk to anyone. Work out. Think about the muscle you're working. Why are you wasting your time going to the gym if you're going to talk to everyone and look at your phone? And then when you leave the gym, if you're not going to eat right, then you're really wasting your time. So the hardest thing for me to do is train and dr drive. I like to be around people that are dedicated and get motivated. But if you're not going to put in, if I'm going to take the time to drive and go to the gym, but I'm not going to take the time when I'm home to have my meals prepped and ready and eat, you don't have to go crazy with a prep, then you're just wasting your time. 
I'll tell you right now, if you don't, the most important thing you need to do is eat right over the training. Just walk and try to eat right. You can build a good lean physique. You don't have to be crazy. So just be careful out there. We don't want you to get injured. So that concludes podcast number two. And uh, like I said, it's a long way to the top if you want to rock and roll. And uh, hang in there. God bless America. I'll see you at podcast number three. Take care.